Okay, so I'm actually very glad to be here because I think this is this retreat is a great opportunity to uh, to step back from being worried about the daily pressures. Yes. I it's education at the high school. Okay. <laughs> it's something we're inventing today. <laughs> so, I was afraid when I saw the original announcement of the retreat that it would be too focused on individual solutions and not take time. So I wanted to fit in a little presentation to to open up the larger issues for brainstorming, where we don't worry necessarily right away about the uh, the practicalities, but we, we try to think of a vision of what eye education should be at the eye school. Um, and to focus on how people learn and what the research, there's been a lot of research about how people learn, especially in the last few decades, um, what that tells us. and. To, to make our questions about technology subservient to the issues of education and how technologies can support them. But first think about the uh, what excellence in education could be at the high school. There, there are a couple dangers in, um, in this approach, especially about thinking about technology. I think technology, it gives great opportunities for new, new forms of education, but there are some dangers. One, of course, is being technology driven, thinking about the technology first. Oh, we have this piece of technology now. Let's, let's figure out how to subordinate edu or educational approach to use that uh, kind of technology. There's also, uh, I think, a big issue in thinking about innovation and educational change is what is the culture? and the research has shown that this issue, what is the culture in the, in the in educational institution, is extremely important and makes all the difference, really. And we have culture in the high school about education at many levels, and we have to consider, consider that. One level is the reward structure for everybody, the college as a whole, faculty members individually, students, and so on. Uh, and how do those reward structures support what we, our vision of what uh, innovative uh, educational approach could be. So since I'm giving a uh, PowerPoint lecture, which I, I'm arguing against giving PowerPoint lectures by giving one, uh, and I'd argue against giving quizzes, so I'll give you a quiz to start out. So, um, what do you think about this? As we learn more and more about a subject, what happens? A, of course it's a multiple question. <laughs> the questions all get answered. B, the questions get easier and easier. Or C, the questions get more complex. So raise your hands. Everyone who <laughs> votes for A. Nobody votes for A. How about for B? For C? <laughs> we know you too well, Jerry. <laughs> this, wasn't a, this wasn't a quiz as to guess what the teacher wants. <laughs> okay, so if we really believe in C, then how can we promote the deep inquiry? Um, how can we, how can we uh, make our educational approach, our instructional approach, um, go along with C? Most of, most certainly a didactic approach uh, corresponds to A. You give a lecture, you, you provide uh, the knowledge, and then the students should be able to answer the questions. That's the, the basic theory of testing. Um, if the questions get more complex, what do you expect as answers when a test? More confusion than when they started the course? It's, it's a complicated issue. It makes the whole assessment process that Susan uh, laid out in a logical way a lot more uh, complex. Fortunately, there's been research that is based on inquiry learning, that things get more complicated as you understand them better. Here's some sources that have been influential for me. 
the handbook uh, on the learning sciences is a real nice summary of main, much of the basic research that's been done recently. This journal on computer supported collaborative learning, I like a lot because I edit it. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of conferences. Uh, these are the ones that I tend to go to that present uh, learning research. Uh, so I wanted to uh, emphasize a couple sort of findings of current learning, uh, learning sciences research. One, that students have to be engaged, and we saw that, of course, in Colin's uh, video. They have to construct their own understanding of the material. That's the constructivism that Susan was talking about. And, and given these things, uh, lectures uh, generally do not provide the best uh, means, of, means of instruction as a sole uh, instructional mode. They have, they have their place, they have their place especially for some topics more than for others and within the general instructional approach. But as the sole or major way, they're not seen as uh, the most effective way. Uh, and uh, a lot of our technology support now through Blackboard is this Blackboard's asynchronous threaded discussion. And there's been a lot of findings, and I think we've all experienced this, uh, is that there are a lot of serious problems with relying on uh, threaded asynchronous. Uh, so I've been looking at uh, asynchronous threaded discussion uh, for a long time. My work as a, my research as a graduate student, I built my own threaded discussion system and tried to put in innovative uh, features in it to support learning that became led to my dissertation system, which was also basically asynchronous. And um, as a postdoc and after graduation, I worked on other systems that were used in classrooms and tried out that were all asynchronous based. It wasn't until I came to Drexel actually that I, the Drexel students I had in my first quarter convinced me that synchronous was much better, much more engaging. And, uh, and I switched so that my, uh, my research while I've been at Drexel has been with synchronous chat-based learning. Uh, while I've been at Drexel also, I've been working on a theory of learning, which I call group cognition. Uh, it's based on the Russian, or inspired uh, originally by the Russian psychologist Vygotsky. And uh, one, one of his major ideas was that individual learning is not the primary form of learning but social learning within groups, within peers, uh, both mother and child, uh, and community learning. That's, that's the, the basic way of people learn. And from that, we learn to also think and learn individually. Uh, and what that suggests is that we need to move away from instructional modes that are based solely on individual learning and stop, to think, stop thinking about our students' learning as purely individual and look at it as group learning and support it as group learning and as community learning within the class and within the whole college itself. Uh, and my research, I've seen that small groups are very powerful learning mechanisms that are different from individual learning mechanisms. And we should take advantage of those. And technology. The main opportunity that, or a, a major opportunity that technology gives us these days is supporting social learning. If you think about the popularity of social networking uh, software these days, and also uh, Blackboard allows us to do our online courses, which couldn't exist without technology. Uh, and it can also, uh, this kind of technology can also support face-to-face uh, -face learners uh, to work together outside of class time. And so I try to find ways where pedagogy can support the collaborative knowledge building that goes on in groups. Uh, and I found uh, not only in both in my classrooms and in uh, the research I do with high school and middle school students on, uh, learning math online, that, that collaborative learning is very powerful in ways that 
go way beyond uh, individual learning. Um, and, and one of the reasons is that students can help each other. And so it's the, the educational process, the learning process, is not totally reliant upon an instructor standing in front of the class. The, the students work together, they learn how to work together, and they help each other, they support each other, they figure out together uh, what these uh, projects are all about. And so um, if, as we saw in Colin's uh, video, they want to they want to invent their own project uh, topics and so on, and they want to deal with things that aren't laid out by the teacher step by step, where they just fill in the blanks. They can do that as in small groups with peers, and they bring together the perspectives of all the of all the students who are in that group, and they and they have a much richer experience than if they went went home and sat down by themselves and tried to think the thing through and also a richer experience than if they sat passively in a class and had the instructor lay the whole thing out for them. Uh, also, in terms of preparing people for industry, 80% of employees these days work in teams. And so if we turn out students who are totally um, uh, in individual thinkers and don't know how to work in teams well, um, then they're going to have a hard time when they go to industry. So in terms of the, the culture here, the response of students to group work is often um, they don't want to have anything to do with group work because they've had a bad experience or they don't understand how to do it or they're just very individually minded. Engineering students are particular. It's well known that, that they tend to be very individualistic and they want to do things their own way by themselves. Um, get their own their own grade and so on. Uh, but what I've also seen is that students who have uh, gone to co-op, they've probably been in a team in co-op and they've, they've learned how to work in teams and they appreciate it a lot more than people who don't. So you see this moving from freshmen to seniors that there's a big shift in their attitudes about this and, and people who have been in co-op and had these team experiencers are much more open to collaborative work. Uh, so as I mentioned, I believe that synchronous learning, synchronous collaboration is much more effective, uh, much more engaging than asynchronous. And I know that it's a problem in many of our courses to have uh, synchronous chat rather than asynchronous. and we have to often fall back on the asynchronous study discussion. But I think one of the things we can do here today is to brainstorm about how we can introduce more synchronous chat into our courses. And I think it is possible to do that even under uh, some of the administrative constraints that we have. How about geographic constraints here? <laughs> right. I mean, people, our students chat constantly with people around the world. And uh, why, don't we, why don't we incorporate that in our classes? You know, students are sitting in the back of your classroom chatting away, but not about your course. <laughs> it's because they're bored with your lecture. And they're doing chat. Why not get them to use that mode, which is, has become, for many of them, their, their preferred mode of, mode of uh, interaction and communication. I'm talking about the master students who may live in many different time zones. I'm not talking about undergraduates in a class. So I think that needs to be part of your Well, I don't want to go into the practicalities. I mean, I usually uh, have people form groups when, it's, when there's going to be a lot of online uh, synchronous work. I have them form the groups based on their time zones. And, and not only their time zones, but when, when they think uh, a good time of day is for them to work on the course. So people who work during the day will pick evening in their time zone and so on. So these things, they can be worked out yet. Um, uh, the other thing is, is blending um, for, for in class, well, the other thing is blending face-to-face -face and <laughs> online. This is also a very powerful thing. In fact, in 
in almost every, uh, other than at Drexel, almost every online curriculum uses some kind of blended. They often, they'll have the students come to campus for the first week, or first few days, or a long weekend or something, before, so they get to know face-to-face -face the other students and the instructor and so on. And that makes a huge difference in terms of their engagement and the social feeling that they have. Just do your time for discussion. So, in conclusion. <laughs> and these are some questions for discussion. So discuss amongst yourselves. <laughs> Questions? So yes. just one, just a comment, just observation. Uh, you talked about the, uh, the value of uh, small group learning and interpersonal skills, and I uh, really, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you. And Linda's here, we analyzed uh, job descriptions about uh, 450, one, of one data set is cataloging professionals, and another one. Uh, metadata professional and uh, we looked at job skills and competencies and job responsibilities we analyzed those data and the most demanding uh, competency job skill concerns uh, interpersonal communication skills and I think this uh, the uh, uh, collaboration group collabor collaboration work and small group uh, activities really uh, you know promote developing this interpersonal communication skill. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, just have a question about the, uh, if you have a student who exists to work on uh, individually as a group, and any suggestions how to persuade them? Can't hear you, Grace. I mean, uh, sometimes I assign students to uh, work through group projects, but some students hate to do that. They want to work on their own. And suggest mm -hmm. how to and there are students who don't know how to work with people at all. Who are really just that have never understood what it means to work in a group and can really cause a relationship in a group and find very good at separating. Yeah, can you speak up because you can't hear me? Well, they, they, they cause so many issues within the group and they've separated them because they, they're just individuals and not. Yeah, group, group work all, almost always goes through, uh, it has its ups and downs. The, the, old, uh, the old theory of, of collaborative work um, was, uh, go, was, there's phrases of um, storming, norming, and performing. So it always goes through a stormy period. And so if your class is based on group work, then your whole class is going to go through a stormy period. And if you only have 10 weeks uh, in your class, then the first five may be uh, kind of shaky, but uh, they always come through it, I found. You may, have to, you may have to intervene and move some people around in groups occasionally, not always, but usually there's one, one group that self-destructs and you have to reassign people. But so you have to, this instructor has a role in, in you know, supervising and making and supporting that group process. But the instructor also has to step back out of the way so the collaborative work within the group at the peer level can, uh, can succeed and get past the storm period and, uh, and learn to work together and then really perform. Hopefully by the last few, few weeks when they're really working on their producing their uh, product, their good product, and things are going well. David? I just wanted to add to um, uh, what the comment made earlier that for over a decade, at the top of every employer's list of success for an employee is not the knowledge you teach them or the knowledge they learn, but interpersonal skills. Right? Regardless of industry, private, nonprofit, whatever, that's it. Uh, that is the number one thing. If you look at the co op, uh, the results of the questionnaire that you send out both to all co op students 
and to our students and to all of the co op employees. And I urge you to take a look at those, they're very important. Uh, uh, you will find again that this is the highest value system there is. Okay. Now, I just want to say, I think it helps, at least I found it helps in my course, if you design a group project that is clearly a group project that cannot be done by a single person right. and really can't be done by, you can divide up the writing of the report, mm -hmm. but you can't divide up the work. Right. Um, writing, dividing writing of the report is something that also happens out in the real world. Um, that's a little bit, that's a little bit different thing, but they certainly consult on the report and they all, and they recognize the structure in a way that you cannot avoid working with the rest of your group to get the work done. Yeah, good, good group product, good group process always includes some individual work as well, which may mean going away from the group for a while and thinking about the thing, doing research, getting resources, and then coming back together. So it, it's a whole process and, and um, the instructor's role is, is to sort of guide that process and lay it help people, help the groups understand, uh, this is what you have to do first. You have to get together as a group, decide how you're moving, what your goals are. Then you, then you can go apart for a couple of days, and then you have to come back uh, and put together this week's report or whatever. There is Mark. Your first question suggested that students were resistant to, yes, it's right up there. Uh, suggested that students were resistant to innovation. Can you give some examples? Because I don't think I've seen that. Really? Well, I think I had my decision. impression is that no matter what you do, somebody's going to complain. If you don't, if if you give lectures, they're going to complain like they did in the video. If you don't give lectures, they're going to say, "Why well, didn't you give lectures?" So, but that's not resistance to innovation. Well, saying saying you don't want to you don't want to do group work. Okay. If somebody says. Um, you know, I absolutely don't want to be in a group. I'm going to do it myself. That's resistance to group work. <laughs> okay. So it's not. So and they're always individuals who dislike. I tell them to use. I tell them to use chat in Blackboard. Right. Blackboard has chat. Yep. They say no. I want to use Gmail's chat right. because that's what I use with my friends. Mm -hmm. So. And I say, I say, then we don't have a record of it that the whole class can look at right. and that I can look at. And they say, and then they go away and they use Gmail chat. Right. That's <laughs> resistance to doing something that, and the reason that I want to be, have a record is because I want them, the whole class, to be able to reflect on their group process that's recorded in the chat. And when they do that in a different format, we can't do that, and so it, it spoils uh, what I have planned for the course, and so they're resisting doing what I want just because. That's what they're resisting. That may be. Yeah, exactly. That may be. But we need to tie up now, yeah. Joe, because we need to move on. So. I'm tied up. <laughs> Did you want to?